it's an Archeo Death interview with Professor Howard Williams and his guest. Welcome Archeo Deathlings to another Archeo Death interview with myself and my special guest all the way from the, the, the harsh, bleak, snow-covered, ice-clad <laughs> north of Norway. We have Stefan. How are you, Stefan? Would you like to introduce yourself to all the viewers? <laughs> to the Archeo Deathlings? Hi, uh, my name is Stefan. I'm an archaeologist all the way up in Tromsø. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. I, I love the opportunity. So thank you very much for having me. Well, it's been really exciting because let's just say um, on social media, particularly on TikTok, where I first met you, we're a small group of people doing this thing. And I, I, I've really been sort of building up the confidence to ask to have a conversation with you because you, there's so many interesting dimensions to what you do on TikTok and what you're doing in your career that I'd love to sort of have a conversation with you about. Um, obviously, Vikings is a shared interest, but also there's other things we're going to hopefully tackle. But I thought we, we could start off by asking you, you know, how did you get into to this archaeology game you know what what have you been up to what's your been career like to date so it, it actually like just a just a general like, like history of me I, I started very young by being interested in archaeology i got the you know how a lot of people say they got like the egyptology book that everyone gets super interested in when they're kids i got a norwegian version of that and i just wouldn't put it down uh, and we also started having because because in norway we're very like influenced by a lot of the viking history and stuff like that so they try to sort of shows that very early on. So we even in kindergarten had field trips to a Viking burial mound that was just next to the kindergarten. Uh, and I got to go there and I got to see it. Um, and I just got to like sort of ignite that passion for what archaeology could become. Uh, so from there on, I tried to get a little bit more interested in it, but uh, got a little bit discouraged by my parents because they were like, oh, but there's not a lot of jobs. You should pick something a little bit more safe. Um, so I went into art, art teaching and I became an art teacher for a little while and uh, then I became a manager of a grocery store, uh, but then I decided that nope, it's enough. Uh, after when COVID hit, I was like, I want to go and do archaeology, that's what I want to do. So I went up to Tumsa with two friends uh, and the reason I went up here is because I've said it before, as you said on TikTok, um, Tumsa has the best, and I mean the best offer for archaeology in Norway in my opinion. Because they give you the field course after your first semester, which means that you can work as an archaeologist in Norway if you can get, if you can get a job from your very first semester, and sort of accumulate that experience over time. So during the course of my bachelor's, I've been able to uh, I've been able to have almost three full years of field experience next to my studies, and then that has also opened doors to a lot of uh, lab work, three D archaeology. Um, and just uh, a lot more, a lot more connections at the different museums in Norway. Um, so, to to see where I am right now, because of the study I did in Tumse, basically I've gotten to um, I've gotten to work with some really interesting people like uh, Eric Schellmann and Johanna Anson uh, at the Tumse Museum. And what we've been doing right now is we've been three D scanning and documenting uh, migration um, cruciform brooches. Like you, you oh, actually fantastic. Them. Yes, yeah, they're amazing. Um, and there's so so there's been about like ninety eight found all over northern Norway, and we've got access to all of them. So we got to document them, three D scan them, and there will be there will be published publications about this later on, uh, with us uh, with us who did the work as co authors, which will be really interesting to see. And I'll definitely send you a link when it gets out. Well, that's a fantastic project. And so it's great to see you're applying your degree, but your degree has always been applied. And and, and I think uh, many people, you know, doing archaeology degrees have different visions of it if they haven't done a degree or different experiences of it. And uh, uh, some of them see it as all just lab and field and, you know, striding around in the landscape. But it's an important part of it is the academic study. But it needs to be integrated, doesn't it? You need to be thinking in when you're in the classroom, you need to be thinking about the field. When you're in the field, you need to be thinking about the bigger ideas. And it's all got to exactly. be c connected up, in my view, anyway. <laughs> I, I definitely agree with you because you have to sort of understand in your in theory, you have to understand what you're doing in practice as well. And we see, I see a lot because I had a, I've, I've, I've worked a lot with the uh, with the younger students below me as well. Um, and the thing is that they know exactly what they're doing in class, and they get out and they they don't know what they're doing. And that sort of um, they sort of need to have both to sort of understand both worlds. Yes, um, it's easier to say Norwegian, but we have uh, I don't know if you know Brian Hood. No, no. 
Um, he, he's he's an ar- he's an Arctic archaeologist up here, and he usually has the um, this creature called uh, Professor Wombat, which is uh, just like a fun little paper uh, paper that you have to write uh, for his class, uh, where you have to write an archaeological report of a field study, but you have to write that on your first semester. So you don't really know what you're talking about, but it's really funny because he has the same paper afterwards. You've been to the field course, and then it's it just it kind of clicks for you. You kind of like understand exactly what you're talking about. You put it on to the different terminologies. You understand the process way better. So I definitely think that when we're sort of relaying archaeology to an audience, we have to because you, you what well, you said a little bit earlier. Sorry if I'm going a little bit off script, but we said a little bit earlier about how we how we sort of integrate and what we should do on social media. I think that we should definitely show people what we're doing and explain it a little bit more in detail what the different things mean. Because I realized after I made a, a long list of videos about the cruciform brooches, but after that I realized not a lot of people actually know what the cruciform brooches are, what the connections are, where they're from, the spread of them, where when they were used. So I, I made a little like information video just about the history of them as well and showed them more. And I I use a lot of 3D in my um, what do you what do you call it, presentation uh, of of the brooches, and it makes a lot more sense to people to see it in like a 3d dimensional space than just a 2d yes i mean that's uh, before before we get into what you do on tiktok i which i love that is a great example which a really good taster uh, of what what you do um i I really want to get a sense of where your interests come from because i didn't know your career and i knew you went back to uh, archaeology and i I think but I, i i really want to get a sense more of of what your line of interests are you love the later iron age or is that the oh, into the viking age how would you characterize your period thematic interest i know you've been on settlement excavations you've been on and you talk about so many issues so do you how would you characterize <laughs> your interests or is it always changing depending on what day of the month or what day of the week <laughs> well it, it changes a little bit it depends a lot on where i've been and what the main interest and what the main dig i'm reading up on right now to sort of relay the information as i'm also gathering it uh, but mostly it's with my main interest is, as I've said, like 3D archaeology yeah. and the applications of that and how open source we can make it, how available to the masses we can and how available we should make it. Um, but uh, during like period pieces, it really Viking Age has been a real big interest and a big focus. Um, but I've also gotten really into Stone Age archaeology, like lithics as well, because up here in northern Norway, there's so many projects that relate. Uh, to the Stone Age way more than to the Iron Age right now, at least for the for the current projects, at least. Yes. Um, and I think my very first full artifact as well, I kind of like sparked that like super interest in the in the lithics was a uh, was a slate knife, a very well preserved slate knife. The head like uh, it's called a oh, rainbow. Yes, I remember slate. that? Yeah, uh, a ra- a rainbow slate knife, and it was, it was there was just something really something really it felt really significant to be be the first one to hold a knife that hasn't been touched in about seven thousand years so it really sparked me into that but then then i tried to uh, my first uh the first version of my bachelor's was actually just to 3d scan and document the knives that we found at the site and then reproduce them in different 3d uh, 3d media so you have uh for example you can do an fdm uh, or a resin print which uh basically just plastic or resin uh, but the plastic one is way cheaper, and it would be, would have been really easy to do it. But you can't really get super good qualities, and it kind of feels a little bit fake because it's like really lightweight. But with the resin, um, it's you could print it as like one big solid piece, and you can get the resolution down to zero point zero zero two uh, percent, so you can yeah, millimeters. So you can see everything. Everything like with the um, with the I printed a stone axe, and you can still see the grooves and the stroke marks of the napping on the prints so, like you can definitely do it um uh, and i tried to sort of take that experience and just sort of uh, sort of try and relay that to an audience that was going to be the main focus of the bachelors but uh, i ended up doing pottery shards instead okay and trying to angle it into a uh, version of reconstructing a vase based on the uh, different shards because in the three programs you can do that Yes, yes, I've been I've been seeing some work done on cremated human material as well, and and how, you know, you're looking at not trying to put them back together, but actually working out fragments, shape, and size, and then 
I'm trying to help understand the technology of cremation from looking at the, you know, really beyond my brain, you know, to cope with. But there's so many you know, positive applications of digital technologies, aren't there? I think it's really exciting. But great. And this is another example, the 3D printing. And also because it's not simply, as you said, it's not simply about, you know, the primary analysis for understanding the archaeology, but then the, the, the public engagement or uh, potential, because you can you can actually talk with things in a way that I actually on ethical grounds and because I don't have a museum in my office you know i can't do that stuff you know but it's, it's you know but but it's really makes the difference for that public engagement doesn't it it really, really really does because i well just like a personal story when i came home uh, after having after having had about two or three semesters up in tomsa and went home to my family to talk to them about what i was doing and stuff i like you saw were like kind of like slight off phases like drowsy like eyes glossing over after the third sentence um but when i then brought home different artifacts that I 3D printed and I could tell the story while they held the artifact in their hands, suddenly they were way more engaging. They started asking questions. They started um, trying to interact with the uh, with the artifact, like showing, on, showing it off to the other family members around the room. So the engagement that we see when we introduce like a 3D media <clears throat> really is quite significantly different than when you just have like a photo or you're just telling a story. Uh, there's also been a study done on uh, like please touch the exhibits, which was a yes. uh, yeah yeah, uh, and and that one also really like highlighted the the engagement levels that we can that we can attain by sort of having this three D printed or a three D uh, virtual reality environment where people can sort of interact with the artifacts in a completely new manner. But it's so important to get people to in engage physically and tangibly with with these objects that that was my resort. But of course, with 3D printing, nothing's ever going to get damaged. You know, it, it's it's just a, a modern product, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a modern product and it's not that hard to manufacture or uh, expensive even. Uh, but there's been this like notion in museums that you sort of need to have like the best grade 3D printers to make the best results ever. And I think that's kind of just a little bit like of, well, and more expensive is better, which isn't necessarily true, which was another point that I was trying to come across, uh, which I've argued a lot on TikTok and social media as well, is that <clears throat> with a, as long as you know what you're doing with a printer, you can achieve high results with low costs, which is why I think it's, it's I, I almost want to say it's, I, I've never used the word before, but like preposterous, that people don't want to use this method even more, because it's also a great way to mass produce, which isn't always good. But for an example, um, we have uh, at the Thomas Museum, we have kids days on Sundays and Saturdays. And I've suggested bringing my 3D printer and, um, and uh, just 3D printing these tiny little arrowheads, which takes about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, and then the kids can bring them, uh, bring them home. They can have them in a little box and they can like pay, pay five doc, like maybe 50 cents, 50, yeah. uh, like, you know. To, to, to print one and they have the, then they have like that interaction and a solid piece of history that they can take home with them and sort of um sort of get this inter um, interpersonal relationship to the artifact which means that they retain we've seen in studies that this they also then retain the information about the artifact way longer and on a different level than people who just sort of see it behind a glass wall so it's it's on from all the way from recording the the archaeology Share, you know, educating in academic settings through to real, you know, face-to-face -face yeah. public engagement and online, it works at every level, doesn't it? And you could explain exactly. the process, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, some, of the, some of the pitfalls that we see are like, for example, what do we do with very culturally sensitive material? I was, uh, I was put in charge of uh, 3D scanning a, uh, a bear skull recently, uh, earlier this year, and that is a bear skull that was taken from a Sami bear grave. Yes. And now the argument is then, should that be open to the public? Because it's very culturally sensitive to the Sami themselves, because I, I don't know if you know about the Sami bear, bear practice. A, a bit, but please elaborate for our viewers. So, so in, in, um, in loose terms, because I don't want to get too much into that specific, but it's more of like a, uh, they treated them as very sacred animals, and it was very important for their culture to the point where like we have so many descriptions of the different rites that they did when they went out to hunt a bear. And when they took it back with them, for example, it could only be brought back through the back of the hut. It could never be in from the front because the back of the hut symbolizes the gate to the underworld and it had to be brought through there for the spirit to find its way out when they done done killing it. So when they also 
were done with every single piece of the bear. They would put the entire skeleton down in a very nice burial, um, and uh, in a very in a very sacred sacred way. Uh, so that skull is very sort of sensitive to the Sami that we, for example, have it, and should we then make that very open and accessible to the public, or should it just be the three D scan? And like, so because it's like when you have a three D scan of an artifact, that three D scan does also in and itself have in, um, <clears throat> properties that make it an artifact as well. You know, because even though it's a different material, it is, um, it's like the ethics of photography. It's not just simply the photograph of the grave may offend people because it's a dead body, but the culture from, it's from, this is an act of desecration of taking exactly. a photograph, you may, you know, of that site. So it's not just a, and people I think get very confused about this online in particular. They think it's all about, well, if you're disturbing the site, you know, whether you're justified or not because a road is going to go through there or a building's going to be constructed, it's the act of digging, but then it's also the act of recording and what you do with that recording. So yes, this is a hundred percent not the original object. There's no desecration, no. Of, but the image and the and the the, the the textures and the designs, or in this case the you know it's a it's a skull of an animal but it's been it's a skull of an animal that's been found in a particular context has been treated in a particular way by a particular culture and there's all of that ethical baggage doesn't disappear just because you're di digitally printing so i think it's fascinating area so what do you think the solution is should you i mean how do you deal with that the way that we do it is that we work closely with the sama thing as well which is like the political organ for the sami people here in norway at least um, I don't know if it relates to like Finland and Sweden and Russia and stuff as well, but especially in Norway at least. Um, we work very closely with them and like, <clears throat> so there's been this big cause, and I think you know this about the British Museum as well, like giving back artifacts to yeah. the indigenous people who owned them originally. Um, <clears throat> and we do that here as well. Uh, so when there is a matter of cultural sensitivity, they're very involved. They're very involved. And I do... I do think they have the right to say no, or at least intervene in some way. Uh, but this was, uh, the 3D scan I was doing was for just to send the 3D scan, not to print it. It was not to do any invasive uh, invasive things on it, any invasive procedures. It was just to make a scan and then send it to a museum. I think it was done in Hochstad, because uh, they were going to make a, a bare grave exhibit, and they didn't want to have the actual artifacts out yeah. in full display. So they had a screen all the way in the back of the hut, where that 3D skull would sort of just be spinning around in three dimensions to sort of show you where it would have lain in the grave. But now, <clears throat> yes, but I'm, I'm very much on the, on the side of, we should share 3D scans, but we should share them in a respectful manner. So as to like, for example, should we have, there's a 3D scan of the museum of a boat grave with the actual skeletal materials of a person inside them. Should those be shared? Should those be given out to people? I don't think I can say 100% yes, because it's a different thing. Having a artifact such as like this, this brooch is different than having the remains of someone, like an identical remain of someone's skull on my desk. Because it also sort of, it, it distances us from what that actually, from the original concept of what it is. And I'm afraid of what kind of connotations it will have if we don't sort of take that step back and say, hey, these are actual human remains. They, they shouldn't be shared lightly. So uh, when I get to my master's, my plan is to uh, write about the aspects of 3D scanning and what materials should be prioritized and what should be shared publicly. So it, it's it's definitely an interesting question. Do you have I any mean, thoughts? The, I, it, it, well, I have many thoughts, but no real answers. Because <laughs> I, I just, I mean, I think one thing I wanted to reflect on in terms of other media is the huge potential for public education, for open access engagement, but also, as you say, human remains are different. And yet, yeah. by explaining that those cruciform brooches, for example, I suspect most of them are from funerary contexts and a few from settlement. I yeah, don't know yeah. for sure. But, you know, but there is also potential and challenges with showing that context. It's not just the human yeah. remains. It's So I, I'm not saying I have a view either way, but I, I see there's so much potential explaining that this stuff isn't just lying around for metal detectorists or looters yeah. to rip out. That this stuff is from funerary context. And yet also, um, yeah the human remains should not be just treated like another thing you can buy on an Etsy store, buy a print of a Sami skull, you know, for $58 yeah. or whatever it may be. You know, that yeah, is, like the, it doesn't get around the... Yeah. Sorry? 
Well, like, yeah, just like the whole uh, John's Bones debacle when yes, he was selling exactly. just for the fun of it. Yeah, he's not going to um, become suddenly ethical by going, hey, guys, I've gone into 3D printing. So my wall of spines <laughs> is now a 3D wall of spines. Pr- pr- oh, exactly. so, yeah. yeah. And, and this, so it's going to show, I don't know if you can see it, but on the yes. back of this broken, there's actually a lot of like remains or um, textiles that was from the the, um, the funeral suit of the person who was in the grave. So these are very these are very sensitive in and of themselves. But this is way less significantly harmful to show and share uh, than I would argue a human skull of the person actually buried. So it it, it becomes because people think that like we have this thing called like the hype cycle, right? When we get a new we get a new technology everybody wants to use it it's the best thing ever and i think we're sort of still we're getting out of that that phase right now but people are still very much like 3d printing and 3d scanning is the way to go but they use it for the most meaningless things like for example we used to um i don't know if, how you do it in britain and field uh, now but do you still like draw things do you draw profiles and stuff train train our yeah. students to do that but i mean how yeah. much of it is really necessary now in terms of in relation to stuff like that yeah yeah and so, so we don't do draw hand drawing at all we use we use photography on ipads and then we draw onto the onto the photos or the photogrammetries to see the different ones i think but, most units are now doing that and have long done that yeah yeah um I just, I just, I've not, I haven't been in, in the UK, so I just want to know. No, um, no, no. Yeah, uh, but so, so the thing is that, like, when we then have huge, huge photograph, like the tiny ones for the documentation purpose, definitely good. But when we have, we have to stop the work for about an hour or so that the drone pilot can take a big photogrammetry of the entire site and the outside of the site uh, every three hours on on, a, on like a good, good day when they're supposed to be documenting. It takes a lot of time away from the archaeological work that we could be doing, and I feel like a lot of unnecessary documentation is being done in 3D just because we can, but it's not being stored well enough or shared well enough. And it, it's, it's so it's, it's, often the case. But it's a classic example: is a museum goes, we've got a pot of money, let's get some experts to record some shit, and now we're going to put it online, and that's job done, rather than any thought to hey look there's three cre- uh, we, we've recorded i don't know 200 objects there's three that we need to redo because the details are not there you know like ah yep. it drives me mad and and it, it, it speaks to what you're saying because it's we see this technology and so many people go yeah let's get a let's get a guy a gal to do that and, and then you think what for why are you doing this how is it going ahead so technology always <laughs> needs a brain behind it you know <laughs> No. You know, we, we did the same thing because we wanted also to make like a catalog of these brooches that we've been doing. So we also wanted to make like the illustrations and we needed like specified training to use the programs to make uh, complicit illustrations of it. So we took the 3D model and then we uh, positioned it very, very carefully. And then we did different screenshots from different angles. And then we angled the, uh, the coloring and shading and saturation so we could see all the details of the object. And those are way better than any photograph that's been, been done on these artifacts ever before, right? And we and we were uh, me finished uh, finished bachelor student and like some some other students doing an internship at the museum to do this, and we were doing better documentation than some of the other things that we've seen out in the field and and after aftercare of the artifact. So you have to know what you're doing and for what purpose you are doing it. So I definitely agree with you on those points. And it's, it's like uh, with the potential for our portable antiquity scheme, because, you know, we have very liberal metal detecting laws, which I don't fully approve of or like. And I've published on this and many archaeologists rant about this. And yet we do have a voluntary system of reporting. But the photographs, when taken, are not always the best. And, you know, if, for, you know, regionally based, county based finds liaison officers had. Yep. But I the problem I, where I'm going with this is. Not only if they had that technology to 3D 3D print, but also if there was this lack of preciousness about it, like with the TikTok video, you know, my TikTok video is there's always some problem with the lighting or the sound or my pronunciation of a Norwegian word or my, 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 (laughs) you know, remembering a place name and I get it wrong. But if you are like, if you want the quality to be the best quality, then you need to have the the you know, the, the the sound man the the cameraman you you need to have me you know you need someone slightly different from me doing it you need a presenter you know suddenly it becomes so precious so 
no one's ever going to do it. So I think you're absolutely right that the tax getting cheaper, we shouldn't be precious. Oh, we have to get the best. We just get something that does the job that links to the research question you're answering. Yeah, it sounds great. Oh, sorry, I'm ranting now, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, please go on. Because this is my this is my niche. This is what I love to talk about. I've been talking about this for hours. <laughs> <laughs> but but well i mean i i think so the, i'm looking all i can say is i want to viewers uh, you're you're you know the beginning of an archaeological career you've got your masters you're thinking of i can't wait to hear about all of that but no. you know i want to hear about how you deal with tiktok uh stefan because i mean yeah. you uh, but there's there's things that i can preface this by saying that we know there's lots of outrage we know that uh, no people don't even watch one video they watch 10 seconds of a video let alone try and work out oh he's done other videos on this let me follow a sequence and you know there's all sorts of problems with the the, the algorithm with people just not understanding you're trying to deal with so many different audiences but you know what for you are the positives i mean what have you been doing with tiktok because you've been doing a you're a success story in my mind so what you give, give me a sense of what you've been doing what type of videos do you produce and how do, how do you yeah. yeah um so so my my video like my tiktok career started when when COVID hit again because I wanted to sort of relay what I was learning and sort of make people's public, public view of Vikings and Norse paganism sort of change a little bit from the very connotation it has to white supremacy and the sort of stereotypical Hollywood Viking and stuff like that. So I started just looking up on, which I probably shouldn't have done, on something called Norse talk and everything like that. And then... Hashtag Norse talk, up, yes. <laughs> yeah, hashtag Norse talk added one. It was, very, it was a very fun in the beginning because people saw an interest in hearing, which I which I can say is both good and bad. They had an interest about hearing someone from Norway's perspective on Vikings, uh, and a lot of people sort of uh, a lot of people sort of listened to me and took it to heart what I was saying. Uh, but then you had the people who were like, "No, I've watched Vikings. I've watched Vikings once. I know everything about Vikings. I know that they're brutes and violent warriors." And I just wanted to sort of change that perspective so i went very hard against very hard against this so it sort, of, it sort of split the community in a way where there was supporters for like authentic viking reenactment and then the hollywood viking bros uh, but I, th I think that my like experience of social media like reflects a lot of people's experience with social media that's both like it's both good and bad do you know because i see you've also had your like you, you've run in with a lot of people that take you way out of context and they try to stir drama just by like the stitching of videos, like they take yeah. one tiny thing you say out of context yeah. and then make an entire case against you for that. So uh, that's sort of what happened to to sort of spark me to go from having 900 followers to about 40,000 over the span of two days. <laughs> um, and it, was, uh, it was the uh, it was the the argument about can you get into Valhalla if you don't die in battle? And I just brought up the question. But what constitutes a battle? Are we going by the old Viking like laws? Are we going by battles now? Like what is? And also, why does it matter to you? So just like sparked questions and little inquiries about what this and this sparked a lot of interesting conversation topics and a lot of arguments uh, and a lot of interest. And therefore, I grew. And then as I sort of saw that I got more and more publicity about this, I wanted to show more and more of like the aspects of what archaeology could become. Because I saw that most archaeology videos that I was starting to post wasn't doing as well as the drama posts. So I wanted to show real archaeology. And the best way that I thought I could do that was to just show my life at, through my studies, essentially. Um, so I started showing uh, stuff that we were doing in like class with like the material we were working with, the different procedures we were being taught, and very like easy steps for people to follow not every technicality behind but just so they understand a little bit more about the job that it isn't just shovel ground dig it's actually more like a, a whole process of documentation and understanding the context of why you're digging there and how you should be digging That's, and that really okay. yeah. you've done so much more than that but i want to stop you there and ask about oh, those sorry. two aspects you know because you've got your i mean i must say that you, you're very honest about your personal beliefs which some people aren't and your personal identity and your nationality and your cultural background which people respect and well some people don't but but the point is people mm -hmm. like that on social media they don't want just a talking head saying this is the way it is but also that second point of a your immersive videos like here's me going off the site and it's on site in the lab they're such a 
that's what TikTok loves is that, well, obviously yep. video, the algorithm doesn't always work that way, but I thought that was a really important way because so many people just don't know what archaeology is as a discipline, let alone, you know, what an archaeologist might do. So I think you, you, you know, I, I, the, that I am an archaeologist and here's me yep. on my day was such yep. an important strategy. I, I thought, you know, anyway, I just wanted to say that, you know. No, no, th thank you so much. It's very high praise, especially coming from you. Uh, I'm actually getting a little bit moved, but it's more <laughs> its more of like the, because I, wa I wanted to relay the fun of it. Like, I, sure, it's a lot of theory. It's a lot of practical hard work, but it's also like just the fun adventure of discovering as well, uh, which is why I wanted to sort of, I wanted to show that. And that's, I think maybe that's also why I'm a little bit into the 3D archaeology, because I want to share it also. I want people to have access to artifacts, within reason um but it's also how do i how do i say it it's also just about sharing the engagement and the fun aspects of archaeology and making the public sort of change their view too because when i told my grandpa that i wanted to be an archaeologist he said why do you hate the farmers <laughs> <laughs> and, why <laughs> why why would you let them grow their fields and i I, and so, I, so that's why I had like a whole series about trying to talk about uh, what happens when, for example, farmers find artifacts in their fields. Because there was a big story in 2018 uh, where two farmers wanted to build two new barns on the property. But then they found when they started digging and did a survey, they found seven burial mounds in all like an enclosed around. So they couldn't dig there at all. So they had to pay for the uh, for the excavation because they wanted to do. Uh, they wanted to go into the graves and do uh, and sort of excavate it away, so they had to pay for it. But um, then, so they could have chosen not to do that, so they chose to do it and it became expensive. And then they were like, "Why is it expensive? We just want to build stuff." Um, and which is kind of like a real weird gray area. But then you have the farmers who find things in their fields, and then they have to stop producing crops in the field. But in Norway, if you can prove that you were going to grow food on that field, the government will pay you back. The estimate of what you would have earned on that field. So okay. it's not that archaeologists. So I had a whole series about like it's not that archaeologists don't want you to grow fields and want to like stop uh, stop progress and stuff like that. It's just that like we have to preserve what is because in the beginning of the 1900s, end of 1800s, not a lot of structures were in place to protect cultural heritage. So a lot of stuff has been uh, just kind of mowed down. I don't know if you know about the Viking settlement in Borg. A bit, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so did you know how that was was discovered? Just a quick, quick, tiny, good story. Go on, go on. And so, so the main archaeologist was diving down the road because he was going to a different site that had been just also been discovered. And as he was driving down the road, he sees a farmer taking his plow all the way over a field, and he's like, "That, that looks interesting. That's that has to be something." But they didn't pay any mind, so he drove down, and he was there for about a week, and then he drove on the way back. The farmer was doing the same thing. But he was like, no, I got to go. I got to go and stop and look. So he stopped. He went up. He looked. And down there, he like took one hand into the dirt. He talked to the farmer and took one hand in the dirt. And he looked and he found tiny pearls right away, like glass beads and pearls. And it was like a very perfectly circular mound shape. No, and I didn't also... know that, actually. I, I, know, I know the no. site, but I didn't know the actual, yep. that anecdote. Yep. Um, no, not barely a mound. Sorry. It was a, it was a house. He, but I found pearls and stuff. And two yes. was around inside the house. Yep. So, so that, that's yeah. So that's we rely on good relations. We rely on, you know, the 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 non-professional. Uh, the analogy I make is a very bad analogy, perhaps, but I say, well, you know, most first responders who save lives are not doctors, <laughs> you know, uh, and in a sense, most people who are finding, I, I, you know, I hope I don't have to do first responding at any point. I have had the training and it stresses uh, the idea of the pressure, but the point is. You know, I, I have a go at metal detectorists a lot, but responsible metal detectorists, local farmers, local builders, you know, local mm. people are the yeah. people we want on our side because they are the ones that are going to be finding stuff. It's their stuff, you know, they're, they're you know, garnering that interest, you know. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> and we have a lot of metal detectorists here in Norway, too. And I actually have a friend who just sent me a message. Hey, look what I bought. And it's a metal detector. And I said, you're going to join a club and you're going to join a club right now. Because they, they have the they know yeah. the laws, they know the sites that they can go to, they know what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. It's the it's the free the freelance metal detectorist that I'm worried about.
Yeah, absolutely. And that's my stance in the UK. I just wish we had a bit of a shift in the the, the culture, uh, but it's really um, difficult. But the, I don't want to go down that too much. But I but actually does segue nicely, actually, into um, <laughs> to other areas where because you do your you've done your north paganism content you've done your archaeology overlap with north mm. north you know paganism and you've done your archaeology here's me being an archaeologist post but you also do archaeology news but you don't do everything and you're very specific no. usually about norway i wonder whether you've refined a policy or a strategy of when you decide something is worth sharing with your 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 tiktok audiences <laughs> So the thing is that I, I know that a lot of news are always spread about the big sites and everything like that. So I try to get like sort of I, I look through the online to see like try and find local news about yes. local news in Norway. So we had like the uh, the boat grave that was found in Renese. We have the, the gold depot that was found just like a few kilometers away from that. And then recently we have um, oh what was that one about again? Oh I had it right. Yes, like for example, Rochelle up in Hofstad, like the new the new thing. The, the ring tune that was found. Oh, I missed that one. I missed that one. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It was. Uh, it's. It's very, very big news. It was that my roommate was actually at the dig site, uh, and I was supposed to be there as well, but I chose to do the internship on the at the museum instead. So it. So it's. It's. It, the, uh, but to get back to the point, the the process is I try to find local archaeology news about Norway because not a lot of it is shared in English articles. Yeah. So I wanted to be because that's also a thing in Norway. Not a lot of things that we find are written in English. So it's not very accessible to people outside of Norway. So I wanted to sort of share a little piece, at least a piece that I can when I have the free time to do it, uh, to share it in a English media to engage a different kind of audience. And I think that's really important, not only because there is a the journalists often pick up misinformation in the process of translation um and but also that people are saying here is my news from our area of the world not necessarily nation but region and here's what i can tell you about it rather than just being another um brit or north american going here is your archaeology <laughs> news from somewhere we used to colonize you know uh, it, it, it does or we still do <laughs> 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 you know but it, it is and people love that and i think that's really important and I, th I think that's a really good you're not just doing every new site you're doing you know that local hmm. things, things i do uh it's a it's a place called research.netalforskning.no which is uh which just means like research dot 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 norway uh, and they they uh, find a lot of good summary articles about local news and especially you can do these keywords on do archaeology and i go in through there so it's a nice little like just, uh, back door into the uh, local news of Norway. <laughs> but if I may say so, correct me if I'm wrong. One of the areas where you do, and I think rightly and in a in a very robust way, go international is on issues of looting. You know, uh, yeah. and you you are wading in on particularly North American, you know, accounts. Especially. You know, especially that. Uh, and and I'd like, uh, what, what's your take on that? What's your start? I mean, because you are rightly very robust on this because uh, and I, I admire it and i sometimes i, I dread having oh god do i shall i do a post about this i, th I can't face it today but i, I admire your no. your tenacity <laughs> <laughs> thank you because it, it, it i will say it's taken a lot out of me at some times because you get a lot of pushback from the specifically the looting community because yeah. they do genuinely believe that they're doing like good work yeah they do they do call themselves hobby archaeologist like like the guy recently like uh clegg davis yeah i will say his name because he he's his name is fully on his profile so it's public knowledge um where he where he digs and digs and digs in areas where there's known to be native american sites yeah and he because the that there's something in the u.s that is like surface law if you find something on the surface uh like for example in florida and it's on private land you can legally take it but what all of these looters do is that they go and they dig. They dig down, and that's illegal. Because you're disturbing a site, and you're going down into the dirt to dig specifically for artifacts. That is classified as looting. But what all of these people say, and all of the, I, there are three main arguments. One is finders keepers. Honestly, I've heard someone say this schoolyard rhetoric to me, finders keepers. Uh, and then you have... Um, I think it's like a law that says if you have the owner's permission of the land, 
then you can legally own it. Like you can take it. Private private landowners can do whatever they want. No matter if they're uneducated on the subject, if they don't understand the harm they're doing, they can still just take it, which infuriates me. It, it's it's such a very poor poor attempt at giving people freedom, but not restricting it enough to protect cultural heritage at all. Uh, so Nagpra has made it illegal to own Native American artifacts in almost all states. But the thing is that the U.S. is such a big country, right? That everything is sort of governed by the overall laws, but then also they have specific smaller laws that sort of negate the big overall laws. Um, and the pushback that you get from that community is just in general kind of hurtful because they they don't they don't they don't care who you are. They will just go attack you personally. And I've had messages sent to my family because of it. Like that, yeah. So it, it's it's very hard. Uh, it's very bad, but when you have people, I get a very lot of support from the Native American community in the U.S. where they say that my work does matter and they feel more safe and they're very happy that someone is sharing publicly very against this kind of looting. Um, because usually it's also the fossil hunters that go out and then they show that they find a Native American arrowhead and they don't explain the rules around it. They just sort of either A, take it with them, B, show people where it is. Or C, straight out explain to people where they can go and find it themselves without telling people about the laws, how to stop it. Uh, and it just generally, it ruins the archaeological record. It ruins the in, entire landscape of archaeology in, in, uh, the, in the U.S. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's, uh, it breaks my heart to see it. So that's why I go very hard against it. And I think it's really sense. important. I think I would echo that it is really important because while I in my more academic moments, I see there's lots of nuance and context matters and da di da di da At the end of the day, in a public pro public setting, we need to be a single voice on this issue because yep. it's not it's 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 worldwide. It's it's a global trade. And it's it's individuals yep. doing their little knick-knacky hobby stuff, but it's feeding a global online hunger for the purchase and the acquisition yeah. of these objects. And it's a, so it's not just one, oh, I'm just one guy here. I'm just in my local area. You can't tell me all the way in Britain and Norway. But it's the impact it has, you know, especially if you've got like 5,000, 10,000, 40,000 followers on social media. It really, it yeah. needs to be more of us need to be doing it so it shouldn't be you out alone is my point you know because no, I, th I think it can be very very stressful Archie wolf has also been very helpful in a lot of this uh because uh, i've been sending some uh we've collaborated sometimes where i've sent him videos of different looters that he wasn't aware of and he's done the same to me and we've made different videos about it and then reported them to the correct authorities i've even made really, videos yeah. On, yeah on how to report them in the countries that they are and people seem to take it to heart and we even uh, we even got to, we've stopped like three or four major looters, but it's uh, there's too many to for me to stop a load, if that makes sense. I think there, um, is, there is. Yeah, I think it's it's only so much you can do. And the other thing is not only sort of the uh, the trolling and abuse and the, the passive, lazy, just casual. Does it matter? You know, a type comments yeah. that does take its toll. But also I'm, I'm, all I would say is that I'm aware very much from my academic institution is I'm already way out on a limb beyond what many of my colleagues and 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 uh you know complaints get yeah. made and i've got to be very careful but it's sad because people in museums working museums who are passionate about this or people who are working in other fields in archaeology in different countries they all share very close to what we're saying but they don't say anything because they know that the second they open their mouths and saying uh, excuse me then they'll they'll be absolutely pilloried on you know by various communities online and yeah it's very difficult territory so i applaud your efforts thank you thank you and and, uh, and again to tie it into 3d archaeology <laughs> um I, I i solemnly believe that by printing native american artifact uh, artifacts and belongings like um and giving them to the looters or to people who find them could sort of insensitize the the motion of like handing in artifacts and getting a replica back it it won't stop from the people who already have all the huge collections and it won't stop people from looting but it will be an incentive to sort of not keep everything you find and to see that like hey we're also on the side of preservation history because that's a lot of looters they praise themselves on being conservationists or loving history and i just want to protect it right 
Yeah. Um, well, then they can do that by handing it into us. And if they want, they can get a little pendant or something to help them remember what they help them do. Because I think I, I think it also stems from a like self insert kind of thing. They really, really want to be a part of it, but they lack either the knowledge, skill, or education to be archaeologists out in the field. And it, it's sad because of sure, of course, we would love to share it with them, but they've sort of gone out of their way to make everyone's life harder. But I think that's the point, isn't it? Is that it's a really difficult balance because at one level you can't shout at everyone, you can't police everything, no. um, but it, uh, but some education and some robust statement needs to be made. And this is where I find the balance really hard because, like, every time I see another ancient alien post, I get tagged in it. I can't, I, I can't do a video about. Every, so actually, I've got a very clear lines. <laughs> I won't, I won't respond on Tartarian mud floods because I, I literally couldn't care less. Uh, and I, I don't. I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but I just life is too short for mud floods. Life is too short for me. You know. <laughs> You know, Sorry, just, you have to have your barriers where you go. I'm not. I can't. I'm not dealing with Nazca planes again. Just my own well-being and like mental yeah. health. I can't engage with this because it's such like an interwoven web of conspiracies that no matter what you say, you've got to be written off as like just another mainstream archaeologist. To quote a very well-known pseudo archaeologist, Graham Hancock. Exactly. And if I'm if I if I can, I mean, it's, it's related. But we've talked about looting, but misinformation, disinformation, more very broadly. We, you've been quite robust on some issues. I mean, I, the one I would love to hear you talk about and give your sense on is the, the term and concept of the Viking Age. Um, but, you know, are, are there others that you'd prefer to talk about? But I'd love to hear what your thoughts on when you decide to speak up on you know, issues of gross misinformation being peddled online. When do you when do you call it in? When do you call out and go, no, <laughs> I've had enough. I've got to speak on this. How, how do you do it? I do it when I see bullies. Yeah. In, in in a very simple in a very simple way. And excuse me if some of my word is very crass, but it just it is English is my second language. So please yes, correct of course. me. No, you're very clear, yeah. Um I use it when I see bullies. When people use their own misinformation to try to lecture others into submission. Yeah. Very yeah. And it's usually very big creators who've made this idea of what a Viking is and sort of built their entire persona around what this Viking is. And then when you, I will always try in the beginning to be like, hey, did you actually know? This is how we use this. This is what Viking is. Uh, you can use it in these and these and these different matters. And although you are correct in your statement to say that, like, you could interpret being Viking as a noun, as like maybe a job, maybe a summer activity, you know, like stuff like that. Uh, but then people always push back to be like, no, you're wrong. And then they sort of just go in this circle where they keep saying the same three rhetorics, uh, which is like the noun, like Vikings a noun, Vikings a pirate, and uh, the original Scandinavians will call themselves Norse or Danes. And all of those spin around a very specific narrative, uh, which is in and of itself a good valid theory. Yeah, it's OK, but there are different alter altercations and different versions of where the origins of Vikings and why we use Vikings in the way that we do. So th the way that I know, there are like three main ones that I've heard about, um, which is that, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a noun um, and that it might have uh, originated from uh, men who attacked out of the Vik, yeah. which is like out, out of the bay. And it might also stem from like words uh, which relates to not being at home or being out at sea or overseas. Yeah. Right? Adventurer, um, a traveler, you know. Adventurer, a traveler. Um, so a when you try to explain... Yeah, pardon? A mariner, I thought, but then that's yeah, perhaps too too broad. But, you know, an yeah. expert, a, a mariner on a long... Yeah, yeah. A long journey. journey. Yeah. 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 No, 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 please. <laughs> uh, so it, it's... And then trying to, like, explain the nuance to a lot of people. Because I, I don't think a lot of people understand that there is a lot of nuance in this entire concept. Um, and, and by nuance, I mean, like, in the way that we use it and the way that we relate to the, world, to the word itself. But also in the fact that, like, we as academics use the Viking Age to loosely relate to, like, the year 793 to 1066. Within the Iron Age, there's like four, uh, three other different, four or three different other periods within the Iron Age, yes. in Norway at least, uh, alone, that like relate to the Iron Age. So we need to know specifically when we're talking about a different kind of like style and brooches 
uh, clothing, funeral rites, locations, kingdoms, chiefdoms. We need to know what time periods we are. So having to explain to people that calling North Scandinavian Iron Age societies Viking Age societies when you're specifically relating to that time period, and that's correct, and then having 70 comments tell you that you're wrong is just, it, it, it really makes your head spin at some times. I mean, so I think... I mean, I think if I'm going to be kind, I think many of them are starting in a good place of some knowledge and they've learned one fact, like the Vikings didn't have horn helmets. Did you know that, Stefan? Did you know yeah. that? Let me put that in your comment section. Yeah. You, they didn't have horn helmets. Yeah. You know, and they, and you, you, I think they want you to go, well done, little yeah. guy. And they're surprised that they don't get. And sometimes I go, yeah, I just go, yeah, whatever. Vikings is a job and I just, I like it and I can't be bothered. But other, but other times, and I, and I know they're also trying to face off against this white supremacist, global, you know, a, a pure race narrative. And yeah, by yeah. saying yeah. it's a job is a shorthand to just knock that down. But it comes with so many problems with it. And I don't think they think it through. So, and, and I, I, I see many of your, your, your compatriots in Norway do this to me too. And they say, well, you're not from Norway. You don't know what you're talking about. And they say, hello, oh. do you not know that the British, the, uh, the island in Britain and the island surrounding it, you know, do you not think that there's any Viking period archaeology here linked to oh. Scandinavia? You know, it's what? like, this is not just about Norwegian and Swedish and Danish nationalism. This is about, you know, a, 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 a phenomenon and i can't believe it because it's really tough to try and get break through that it's mostly it's americans but it's oh, also it's but it's, it, i've also had to like sort of go out and call out my own followers and say hey just because i'm scandinavian and i live in norway does not mean that i'm a hundred percent authority on what happens in norway and about its history yes. i am learning every day and so are you and i have to go into my comments and i have to go when they go, wow, you're arguing against someone who's from Norway? How dare you? How dare you lecture someone else about their own history? And I'm like, their own history. I once had realized, hey, this guy actually corrected me. He's right. <laughs> like, you know, like there, there is this sort of like this, um, what do you call it when like you're kind of like uh, not relating to the topic at all? Like dissonance? Yeah. 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 There's like yeah. dissonance around sort of understanding that like Norwegians aren't authorities on Vikings alone. Like everyday everyday Norwegians don't know that much about Vikings to begin with, yeah. um, so it, it becomes I would definitely understand it, like breaking through that barrier of like sort of especially as someone from like the UK with a lot of American followers as well, where you talk about something from Norway. I'm assuming you get a lot of those followers that are like, "Wow, how dare you speak about Norwegian issues if you're not Norwegian." But they're happy as American. They're more than happy to speak about Norway. <laughs> but, they just don't want, but it's really funny. <laughs> There's so and many dynamics. Also, and sorry, go oh, on. Yeah. Have you got? Have you ever gotten the comment that's like, um, I actually have a lot of Scandinavians on, that agree with me on this. Yeah, and you're like, okay, who are they? Who are these people? Are they academic? <laughs> are they professors in their field? Experts? No. I, I've had I've had the I was taught by a Scand. I've got a history degree from Oslo, and my professor told me this and therefore you're yeah. wrong i said well i'm literally reading i'm so this, i am not an expert yeah. in the scandinavian languages i'm not expert in the historic languages that become scandinavian languages i'm literally reading out the authorities on this topic and you're yeah. having a go at me for reading out the academic material i'm not reading it out but i'm i'm giving you a you know and i've cited my sources and they're still angry going, but i heard it at school a man in the street in 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 trondheim said you know, yeah. you know it's that level it, it's it's <laughs> i don't know it's frustrating but um, there's only so much you can go with it but i've got a very at the moment i've got an icelander who has got about 15 accounts trolling me going he was rude to me he, i'm an icelander i know my language and i and, and i'm I, I, I've, I've, I've seen that person. I, I responded to one of their comments i was being like hey sorry you're wrong or like hey uh you you the things because usually the thing is like they're not completely wrong either no but no completely like in, I'm, I'm not going to say insane, but like they're, they're they're applying it in a completely unrelated manner to the topic at hand. It, and sometimes it is about yeah. we we need to be gentle. Sometimes we need to be kind and realize people don't know much and they're struggling with a second or third language. And I really do try to be kind, but sometimes I just have to go. No, <laughs> I, I've given you time. Comments 
Usually yeah. after the comment, that's when I go, all right, you're not listening to me. We can stop it here. But if you keep commenting, I'm not going to be like gloves are off kind of thing, you know? And, and this is the, I'm, I'm, this is what I'd like to sort of not conclude with, but I'd love to hear your view on near the end is what do we need to do differently? I mean, sometimes I think perhaps I'm a new or perhaps we we don't we're too tough. You know, sometimes perhaps we're too kind. Perhaps we're I, I don't. But what, what do you think? Do we just need what do we need to be doing in the future, Stefan, in terms of this social pe- engagement? Are we doing enough of the right things or are we just in a, an experiment that will disappear and no one will care in two years? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts. I think what we need to do is we need to get more. And, and bear with me this. I think we need to get more institutions on social media. I think yeah. we need to get more because Trump's Museum has its own like TikTok profile. It has okay. its own Facebook profile, but it doesn't use it. There hasn't been a video uploaded in two years. Like they don't they don't engage with the audience. So a lot of the things is like you get people like, for example, me or people like Dane Robertson, who's also doing a lot of good work on TikTok, um, where it's just so if it's 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 just us it's there's no one behind us backing us it's just us against them but when we start to get like more of a community around it because as we say it it it's like we we i would also conclude you as a success story there's a lot of people up here in archaeologists and students that i talk to that know about you because they've seen your videos so it's more of like uh, having the backing of the institutions and universities and making it in a position of museums to be socially responsible, like social media responsible, and just sort of show the different labs, show the different procedures, talk to the archaeologists and do stuff like that. We've had uh, an initiative now that almost every single site that I've been on in the last three years have had some sort of social media responsible person that posts about the dig, updates it, uh, shows different findings, show the archaeologists working there, makes nice aerial photos and documentation, so I think that we just sort of we need to keep going with in that direction, uh, and of course keep, keep keeping it light and fun with the individuals, like for example me and you, light and fun and having stuff and educating people in the way that we do. But I feel like we would benefit from having institutional backing. I think so. I think so. I I, I personally I've given up on that aspiration um, in my own <laughs> perspective. Um, yeah. But but I think that is so important, particularly if students and younger career individuals are going to feel they've got their back. We talked about metal detectorists often lose yeah. sites with good intentions and feel. And if they get a bit of credit and a bit of ownership, then they can be really responsible s- sort of information. The same goes with students and and the younger career. If we all we see is every time we say something on in public with social media. And someone goes, you're wrong. You're absolutely freaking wrong. And here's 15 reasons why you need to shut up. Then they're not going to do it. But if they get a bit of, you know, an interaction with institutions, a bit of support, then I think they can build a confidence. And yeah, we're going to get things wrong. We're going to say, I, there's loads of videos. Well, actually, if I, I'm going to, I'm going to double down here because I'm not going to have this little swine tell me or whatever it may be. But honestly, <laughs> I go, yeah, I actually don't, haven't read enough about that. But you know, I, I stick with it, and you do another video that builds on it. But my point is, we're always making mistakes, but at least we're doing it low tech or relatively low tech yeah. and keeping that feed going rather than just one post per year and and nothing then you know is building that yeah, yeah. also like cuz the things that i think that if they would stand with us it would show a lot more solidarity around the issue because we also have the arguments from looters at least i get them oh i tried to hand in my artifacts to museums and they didn't want them or archaeologists have deemed this area not important and we can just go and loot as much as we want because yeah. that's also just simply not true but yeah. without knowing what institutions they talk to and we can back up their claims it's sort of like just a shot in the dark and you have to take them at fast value and i just for one do not no. um it, it's really difficult isn't it and 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 there's also a lot of people who want to stoke drama over over between people when there's often not a lot of difference between views so sometimes when i go against someone i am doing it like just like hey this is kind of illegal. You shouldn't be doing it this way. Kind of just trying to like engage with them and tell them that you shouldn't be doing this, but in like a good fate of like, Hey, I'm kind of looking out for you. You can get in real trouble for doing this, but then they yeah. take it as like oh, you're against me. How dare you? It's a difficult yeah. game, isn't it? I tried to do this with another creator and he suggested it and we did a, 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 some robust exchanges, but the comment section just went ugly and it wasn't, I, I don't disagree with anything he said. Well, I do, but I don't, 
I didn't think it was that serious a disagreement, but the comment section got tribal. It was like, yeah, here's another Brit telling us I, it was yeah. Irish in that case. And I was just like, oh, God, I just, I just, it was just too much because it was really sort of personalized, you know. Because yeah. like, what you do in those situations, yeah. you have to, like, you have to like either completely take a seat back or you have to pick a side. Yeah. You can stand yeah. out and say, I'm not picking any sides, but then the battle is still going to go on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, I mean, I curate my comment section as much as I can, but there's always somebody saying something odd in there. <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of, is there anything else you wanted to raise or pr promote while we're while we're talking about what you're doing and your perspectives on either archaeology or social media and archaeology, 3D printing? So I, I, I kind of just wanted to like, because uh, I, I had a point that I forgot to mention was that like in 3D archaeology was like really important to me. Okay. Is the I mentioned it slightly, but I just wanted to say that to the people who would like to see the project that we have been working on, just like an example of the open sharing uh, on Sketchfab, I can send you the link if you want it in the, the description. Yes, stuff. everything for the description. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. No worries. Um, and we, we uploaded everything that we've done to the brooches and the 3D files themselves to this website you can look at them in three dimensions and even download them if you want to 3d print them yourself or if you're i don't know if chester university has a 3d lab but if you'd like if you'd like you can download some of the files and just put them into the machine and 3d print them like fantastic in fantastic we, we have a 3d printer but i'm not up on what's happening with it and what's going on oh. uh, it's in it's 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 not exactly a lab it's a proto lab it's just it's a, a, a unassembled lab i think it's the diplomatic way of putting it i'm not involved <laughs> <laughs> I wash my hands of the whole thing as I often say no but, but it's, it's it's a really good it's something that really could get students involved more I think in in a lot of these these resources and and engagement so where can people find you if that's not already obvious uh Stefan where can people can uh, so they can find me on uh, on TikTok uh, my handle is uh, Stefan Buck Sigils there is another account actually there's three accounts pretending to be me uh, but I'm the only one with the biggest following, and uh, everyone else has like a slight deviation of the names. So, like, but they all block, them, so I can't see them. So I don't know. I, I just know other people that I've heard. Uh, and if it happens. Uh, pardon? It happens. They're, they're probably trying to sell tarot readings or some kind of grift. There's always um, some yeah. some bullshit, you know, grift. They basically take steal a big creator's name and then, yeah. <laughs> you go like, hey, would you like a free tarot reading? Only pay for my subscription. Uh, <laughs> And, and if, if anyone wants to uh, read a little bit about what I've done, because I, I do have a publication, it's not super peer reviewed, but it's uh, it's uh, a um, a soil analysis of the uh, of um, done in Labrador, Newfoundland, Canada, uh, where we did uh, where we analyzed phosphate samples to see the different activities of areas on a a abandoned uh, waterworks like water station, power plant, yes, water Fantastic. power plant. already in print. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and well, when we publish the data about the brooches as well i'll be co-author on those so that'll be fun well you know it's really going to be exciting to see you your career develop and uh, see your many activities online as well and it's been a great pleasure talking to you stefan and you know just 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 thank you for sharing all this information and uh, and it's going to be you know i'm i'm looking forward to healthy discussions and debates and <laughs> slaying of misinformation uh, not in a metaphorical way on on social media with you and uh, but thank you for today i better watch out because i do have a lot of 3d printed axes <laughs> it's like some sort of Mar Marvel superhero baddie who's like, I have seventy thousand more of these, you know, sort of <laughs> they're being sort of evoked. Yeah, ridiculous numbers, you know. But yeah, they, we need them. Two are printed. Break one of me and two more are printed at the same time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you for today. It's been brilliant, and uh, let's keep doing time. fighting the good fight, mate. It's been great. Well done. You too. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video please consider subscribing to Howard Williams on YouTube. In addition, consider following the Archeodeath WordPress blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.